Hello, we're going to look at some multiplicity today, and we're going to look at uh, situations where it doesn't follow the typical n plus one rule. Sometimes this is called uh, complex coupling or splitting. Um, it's not that complex, it's just uh, a little more than the n plus one. So remember, if I'm looking at this hydrogen and there are no hydrogens on the, door, the carbons next door, this is n plus one and n is zero, the number of hydrogens next door and I get a singlet. So if I'm looking at this hydrogen and I see one hydrogen next door, it's n plus one, that's one plus one and I get a doublet. So you've been doing this for a while. So these are not very clear. So this is a CH2, there's three next door. These are bolded. Hopefully it shows up better in your workbook. And so that's three next door plus one is a quartet. You need to be able to go back and forth either way. So we're going to talk a little bit about where that comes from. And where um, you can predict it with the Pascal's triangle. The way this comes from is that these hydrogens look over next door and they see three other magnets. And those magnets could all be aligned. And remember, magnet is going to affect the shift. So we have sort of where that proton would show up right here in the middle of this. It's called the Larmor frequency. And then what happens is that if there are three tiny magnets all aligned, it will shift it this way. If there are two magnets aligned up and one down, and we have three possible combinations of that, it will shift it a little bit that way. And the same thing if we have two pointing down and one up, it'll shift it a little bit upfield and more upfield if they're all pointing down. So there are four possible spin states, all up, two up and one down, two down, one up, and they're and all down. Now, in reality, there's three possible combinations that will give you two up and one down, and three that will give you two down and two up. So what that ends up being then is a one to three to three to one possibility. So if it looks over and it sees this, then we see a little peak here. If it looks over and it sees this, we see a bigger peak. So you can predict these with the statistical analysis. So if I look at the methyl and it looks over and sees a CH2, we would predict that it could both be up, one could be up and one could be down, the other one down, that one up, or both down. And so that's a one to two to one ratio. So that's where the coupling comes from. So now, and then we're gonna go through, we're still doing the background on this. This coupling, we're going to use some terms over here so that we're clear on it. We refer to the coupling as J. Who's coupled to who? And right now we've only ever seen hydrogen, hydrogen in other videos. And later in the semester, you'll see some H to C, or you might see phosphorus to carbon or deuterium to carbon, whatever. Um, so we're going to define who's coupling to whom, H to H. And we're going to how many bonds. So almost everything that you've seen to thus far is three bonds coupling from hydrogen to hydrogen. Um, now what we haven't said is that there's a specific value in that distance. So if we're back here, how big these magnets are affects how far down or upfield those shifts are. And we call that coupling constant. So that J is a coupling constant. And it's a value that's uh, independent of the size of the instrument. So, and if this hydrogen is coupled to this one by, so the CH3 looks over and sees this and we get a 7.1 Hertz coupling, then by George, if I'm over here and I go look at this direction, it better be the same. So that also tells us something about who's coupled to whom, because those constants have to be the same when you're going one direction or the other. 
So still back on regular coupling. Now, what we're going to talk about is if I'm observing proton one and it looks over and sees proton A on one side and proton B on the other, that should look like a triplet if those are the same size magnets. But if those magnets, for some reason, it's viewing the size of that magnet differently, I could have both up. I could have the big one up and the little one down. I could have the big one down and the little one up and those are no longer equivalent. Before when we were doing the triplet, those two were equivalent because we were assuming they were the same size magnet and then both down. So now what I end up with is four different peaks and we call this a doublet because it was split by a doublet by looking over and seeing proton A and it was split by a doublet by looking over and seeing proton two. And so instead of a triplet, it's really a doublet of doublets. And I'll posit for you that a triplet um, is really also a doublet of doublets. I'm just gonna change my color here for a moment because it just happens, blue here, that it has the same distance here and so when I go to do the coupling constant, it's here, and then this one shows up twice as big. So it's a doublet of doublet that happens to show up on top of each other. So all triplets are really doublets of doublets, but they don't show up that way unless the hydrogens have a, a difference. So this will be the J for one, um, one of these coupling constants, H1 to A, for example. And then this will be the other coupling constant because they aren't going to have the same coupling constant now. So we're going to need to learn to report them with the different coupling constants. So here's a classic example of a molecule that has two different types of coupling constants. We see this pretty regularly on alkene structures. So this is a very, uh, it's nice, it's spread out. My methoxy is nowhere near it. And so the only other peaks in here beyond the methoxy are this um, terminal alkyne. And we see this pattern. And so on that, there's, remember we don't have free rotation. so. B is coupled to C, B is coupled to A, and it will be a doublet of doublets. C is coupled to B, but it's also coupled to A, so it'll be a doublet of doublets. And A sees C and B, and it'll be a doublet of doublets. And our regular coupling constants here, so B and C are on the same carbon, that's called geminal coupling, and that's actually fairly small. And so that's 1.5 Hertz. A and B are cis, and that's pretty common to be about eight to 12 Hertz. And trans is about 12 to 18 Hertz. So this is a beautiful system where you get three very different coupling constants. And so if I look at, um, this is observing proton C. So proton C has a tiny coupling constant, and a very large one. And so here's the tiny coupling constant one, and it'll be echoed on both doublets. A or C to B will have a 1.5 Hertz coupling, but C to A will have a 17.4. And so that will show up like that. Um, ah, I didn't measure them here. Um, this is proton B. Proton B should have a tiny coupling constant also, that 1.5 from here to here, um, 1.5. And then it should have a B to A of 10.5. And you can see this is about half the distance of that one. So that's the 10.5. So now if we were to predict the third one, which would be proton A, let's see over here. HA will also be a doublet of doublets, but it should have a 17 and a 10. So it should show up with 
a 10 and a 17. So here's my 17 and here's the 10 and the 10 would be echoed over here as well. So that one really shows up nicely. And that's, as you can see here, you can see all four lines probably, but these you can only kind of look like doublets. But every time you get this terminal alkyne, you'll get this pattern with three doublets of doublets. Um, when else might you see this? Um, well, I'll just take a quick look. Pretty typical for alkanes, you'll see six to eight hertz and so you don't see the complex coupling because they all have about the same size coupling constant. We see it on chairs. Okay, so the cis equatorial is small. You could go in the workbook, you can go through a little more detail about the car plus equation and predict what the size will be. But if they start to, if they have a very small dihedral angle, they'll have a small coupling. The trans has 180 uh, degree dihedral angle, and it has a pretty large coupling constant. And the cis, did I call this cis? This is trans. This is trans. This is the trans diequatorial. This is the trans axial. And then the cis diequatorial, uh, or sorry, equatorial axial is, can range a lot from zero to seven hertz, depending on the chair and the groups. So then we also saw this, we talked about these a little bit, alkenes, and then we'll see sometimes some of this coupling can vary a bit on aromatic rings. And Another time, so we see it on aromatic rings, we see it on alkenes, we see it on chairs, and we'll see it on carb diastereotopic hydrogens. And diastereotopic hydrogens are often the hydrogens next to a chiral center. So if this is my chiral center, these two hydrogens do not see the same thing. Um, so these two hydrogens will show up separately. So, yeah, they, and they will show up as then, this one will show up as a doublet of doublets, and this one will show up as a doublet of doublets. So these are your diastereotopic hydrogens right here. And then this is the hydrogen that sees C. So this is C and it sees A and B. This is A and B. And sometimes people think this is, and it'll often integrate as a CH2, just be clear that it's the hydrogens are showing up separately. So walk through some of these different examples and take a look at the way we want these reported. Because usually we report that J constant, we usually say um, HH, don't think I put this in there. Um, You'll say it's a doublet of doublet, and you'll list the two, the coupling constants, maybe 17.4 and 10.2. So you need to have both the coupling constant and the multiplicity in there when you report these peaks. So that will be one of the learning outcomes is reporting those correctly and then using that to figure out the structure of the molecule. So go do some practice on these and looking at when they show up.